whereas Dr. Jones rides his bike to work, our next speaker is an Iron Man, so he rides the bike and swims and runs to work here today. <laughs> the Louisiana native Dr. James Henderson is a professor extension uh, extension professor in forestry in Michigan. Welcome, sir. Thanks, John. Well, good afternoon. Um, in this particular study here, uh, as I originally submitted the abstract, we were just going to look at evaluation of even age stands. <clears throat> and then we had a little bit of bad weather, and that created a little opportunity for a little more time. So we added in an analysis of uh, uneven age stands as well. All right. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Brent Fry, he's a hardwood silviculturist that worked with me on this, uh, this study. Now, when we're talking about the valuation of uh, hardwood stands um, for timber, one of the things that factor into that are basal area concerns. And thus, one of the concerns that we have with managing for wildlife versus managing for timber and calculating the trade-offs. Because by reducing basal area, that introduces, uh, introduces some concerns for quality. And I'm going to go into more detail on that. Uh, for this study, we're looking at Putnam, 1960, his publication on bottleneck hardwood management. Uh, two tables there, one for even age management and one for uh, uneven age. And we're going to look at a variety of species, particularly on the even age stand scenarios. We'll look at red oak, white oak, ash, and mixed hardwoods. And then we'll conduct evaluation uh, of those respective management regimes over time to try to come up with a dollar value for both the even age and the uneven age valuation. And then look at the returns for each uh, by species for a range of growth assumptions that Putnam outlined in his publication, and also for each management type. Now getting back to the basal area concerns uh, that exist when trying to quantify the trade-offs between a wildlife-focused management and a timber-focused management is that one species composition. What are you going to be able to regenerate in these forest types over time? The red line there in uh, this graph uh, adapted from uh, Oliveira et al. 2005, that red line is showing where red oaks are competitive in terms of being able to regenerate. They need an opening to regenerate. Uh, the, shape, the, the, uh, the kind of teal shaded area summarizes the basal area targets that uh, are listed in the DFC management guidelines. And you see what species are more competitive there for regeneration, according to this uh, diagram. And oaks are less favorable, according to this analysis. So that, that factors into our concerns about valuation because we're starting to regenerate shade tolerant species that for a timber production point of view are lower value. And that's a concern if timber income over time is your objective. Another way of looking at this in terms of our basal area concerns, aside from species composition, is timber quality. And that's been mentioned a few times this morning managing for quality timber products. Um, there was an adaptation from Putnam that generated a stocking guide framework. This was published in the Southern Journal of Applied Forestry. And in this guideline, it shows uh, a point where thinning or, or, or removing trees from the stand is, is ideal in terms of not introducing epicormic branching or uh, promoting persistent branching which translates into lower log quality. Well, there's a snapshot of that particular graphic. And again, you see the B line there that I've highlighted in red. Uh, and any point below which, if you thin back to that particular basal area, you're introducing the prospect for epicorn branching, persistent limbing, that introduces concerns about log quality. So when we're trying to compare the two management regimes wildlife focused or timber focused, this factors into the trade-off that, that we know exists between doing a wildlife focused management or a timber focused management. And this diagram here is also trying to illustrate 
the concern about a lower basal area and maintain that over time as opposed to a tighter, a higher basal area that will encourage self pruning and again resulting in timber of higher quality for lumber production. So again, our concerns about persistent limbing and epicormic branching that would uh, be encouraged by keeping stands at lower basal areas. So you see the relationship there between average diameters as that increases and trees per acre and falling below this red line. So you'll see um, that Putnam's management of even age stands is going to be calling for basal areas above this red line. Some of the assumptions that went into this analysis, uh, which I'll get into later about uh, timber prices and some of the growth assumptions, but building up a little bit more here, I'd like to talk about basal area and the issue of log quality. This is just an, an idea of the value of the lumber products that can come out of quality hardwood saw logs by the different grades. Very valuable products. And it all depends on log quality or log grade. Log grade goes down, you get more of the lower value timber products. I believe my next graph has some illustrations, yeah. So again, why we're concerned about basal area in terms of being able to manage for timber production and calculating the trade-offs if it's more of a, a wildlife focused management machine that, that calls for maintaining lower basal areas. You won't be able to use that much first and seconds high value lumber. It's going to be producing a lot of this stuff. Uh, number two, 2A, 2B, it's going to have a lot of limbs that translate into knots. So, and again, just a, another look at high quality lumber coming from quality timber products at the top as opposed to lower value products at the bottom. What drives into that? Limbs. How do we control limbs? Tighter basal areas. Lower basal areas mean more limbs. You see the, the relationship, it's pretty simple. And hardwood timber production, saw timber quality products, uh, that's important in Mississippi. This graph here shows revenues over time for hardwood saw timber and hardwood pulpwood going back to 1983. The green line there is hardwood saw timber revenues. Uh, the blue line is hardwood pulpwood revenues. So hardwood saw timber is, a, is an important market in Mississippi and generates a large portion of forest product values. Now, with that background, going to some of the methods for the valuation. Again, as I alluded to, we're going to use um, Putnam's 1960 publication, Management Inventory of Southern Hardwoods. We're going to look at two tables, uh, table six on even age stand and table seven, the even age stand. And table nine provides us with some guidance on the growth rates by species, which will apply. Now, table seven is that hypothetical stocking of um, an even age stand. It doesn't specify species, so we can refer to table nine and obtain growth rates, 10 year average diameter growth rates by species, which will apply to table seven to determine how long it takes to reach certain diameter classes. In order to value, in order to value hardwoods, or value force for that matter, I have to know what's being cut and when. And table seven on its own doesn't tell you when it's being cut, but applying table nine, we can calculate that. It's the same slide. And there's a, a look at uh, table nine from uh, Putnam that is showing growth rates by diameter class by species. So you can see um, red oak, white oak, ashes, variety of other species, and we'll be applying the red oak, white oak, ash, and uh, mixed hardwoods in our analysis. Another thing that Putnam indicated about Table 9, because these are growth rates for, let me draw your attention to that there, unmanaged stands. And in his text, he indicates that with management, these growth rates could be increased uh, up to 30%. So in our analysis, we'll, we'll include that, uh, that increase in growth. There's a, snap, a snapshot there of table seven, where he's showing the average diameters, basal area, number of trees, uh, by diameter class. 
You open the book up on the second uh, side of the, of the book, on the, across the spine, he gives the uh, volume information that will be harvested. So again, we're looking at uh, uh, three species, red oak, white oak, and ash. We'll also include a, a, a grouping for mixed hardwood. And Putnam doesn't indicate here how long in this table, how long does it take from a generation to reach the two-inch diameter class. In the text of his publication, he indicates that it could take anywhere from 8, 10, 12, to 15 years. So in our analysis, we'll look at evaluation for each one of those 8, 8 10, 12, 15 years. All right. So that, that essentially results in eight possible scenarios for each species, because we're also going to look at the managed growth rate versus the unmanaged growth rate. Uh, some of the economic assumptions we're including here, uh, we're assuming that the landowner wants a, a 4% rate of return. Um, that material that would have to be cut at the two-inch diameter cutting would essentially be pre-commercial, so we included a cost for that analysis uh, of over $111 to do a pre-commercial thin. And then there are the valuations that we're going to use for the different product categories, which is an average for the Southeast US from 2001 to 2011. So you can see some of the more valuable product categories relative to the others. Uh, the price per thousand board feet doyle for red oak, produces a very quality timber product in terms of lumber, uh, white oak, uh, ash, and mixed hardwood, which when it's just sold, um, species not segregated out, it commands a much lower value. And again, these prices are from Timber Mark South. That's the price reporting service for the Southeast US. <coughs> and there's a graph uh, showing the, the prices that were averaged there over that period of time. And again, the, uh, the red line is showing red oak saw timber. You can see the price premium that commands over a white oak and ash and mixed hardwood. Again, I mentioned that uh, the two inch diameter improvement cut for the even age stand, uh, that's not going to be a revenue, that's going to be a cost. And then how to value this. Uh, we're going to value the land, the bare land for growing these trees in both the even age and uneven age setting. So we need the net value at the end of the rotation or the cutting cycle and we'll plug in our interest rate, which so it was four. And then we'll compound all of those uh, values, harvest values, revenues, and costs uh, to the future to compute a net value at the end of the rotation or cutting cycle. Get to the results. Uh, this is a, a snapshot from the uh, Excel spreadsheet of how we had to grow these stands over time and how many years it takes to reach the different diameter classes for the even age stands. So here's red oak white oak and ash using the unmanaged growth rate, but we're talking about a managed stance from a folks with managed growth rates. He said it could be anywhere from 8, 10, 12, to 15 years. So starting from there and applying the growth rates by diameter class from table nine, we can calculate the year in which these cuts are going to occur, which you need that information to put a dollar value on the stand. Has to know when and the point in time it occurs. So here's a, a snapshot of um, the economic returns for red oak. That was uh, assuming reaching the two inch diameter by age eight and a 30% increased growth from table nine. And what goes into calculating land expectation value? There I'm showing $1,188 value of the land, what someone could pay for bare land to grow these trees under this scenario. And what figures into uh, the net future value is that final harvest um, and the preceding intermediate cuts. So according to this analysis, we're looking at a financially optimal rotation age here at about year 54. One of the limitations of this study is Putnam doesn't provide any information on log quality. And we've already discussed how important log quality is, so that's going to be an area for some, some uh, future research. But I'll show you graphically the results I'm pulling from a series of these tables. That's just for the two inch, eight inch, the two inch diameter at age eight. That would be this top line. And the dot there is showing the financially optimal harvest age. So on the managed stands, we're looking at LEDs that range, depending on how long it takes to get to the two inch diameter class, anywhere from eight to 15 years. 
LEDs that range from uh, over well over one thousand dollars to almost nine hundred dollars. <throat> so that's the average LED uh, for red oak in in this even age system. And there's white oak. Uh, growth rates aren't quite as fast as red oak, and you saw from the average prices for the U.S. South, it's bagged a little lower than red oak, so it commands a lower LED. Um, similarly with ash, uh, the value of ash relative to red oak or white oak is lower, so the LED is lower as well. And then we included mixed hardwood saw timber, and those LEDs were a little higher than ash. So. We can see that the value of an even age hardwood forest varies greatly by species. And then why controlling for species regeneration, if timber production is your objective, why that's important. If you're trying to maximize revenue from timber production, you want to control as much as you can the species that's going to be regenerated. And clearly, uh, red oak generates the highest revenue uh, of the ones we can sit here. Now I want to talk about the valuation of the uneven age stand. Again, table six from Putnam. What information does he provide us with here? Well, he gives us this table that shows the beginning of a new cycle, uh, midway at the end of cycle, and then how much is being cut. Uh, he gives us some guidance as to the length of the cutting cycle, but it doesn't tell us exactly how long it takes to develop uh, a, a new uneven age of forest. So in the valuation, I'll explain this later, we're going to, have to subtract out the value of a beginning cycle forest from the end of cycle to come up with uh, an approximation of, of land expectation value. Uh, one more thing I want to say about this table is Putnam said uh, maybe 10 years, but anywhere from 8 to 15, that it would take to go from beginning of a new cycle to the end of a new cycle. And you look at these volumes here, particularly on the saw timber. Let me clarify here. Th these volumes above here are pulpwood volumes, smaller diameter. These are uh, larger diameter volumes, saw timber. And look at the increase. It's, uh, it's almost doubling there. So to double that kind of volume in 10 years, we're looking at a growth rate in excess of 7%. Do it in eight years, we're looking at growth rates in excess of 9%. Those are really high growth rates. Were you flashing confidence or are you, or are you saying you believe in a 5% growth rate? That'd be five. Okay. <laughs> so, considering that and what we know about uh, growth rates, for the even age stand, we're looking at growth rates on the even age red oak, which was one of the faster growers, were about 3 or 4%. So, using a 15 year cutting cycle is being generous then in coming up with a growth rate in excess of 5%. One more consideration I want to include in here. We've talked about our concerns of maintaining lower basal areas, and here uh, Putnam's peaking in the cycle basal area at, at almost 110 and taking it back to below 70. We, we have some concerns about log quality. So I want to just include a, a consideration for log quality. At 100% of saw timber volume being applied, all of this volume here is going to be cut is saw timber, over 5.2 MBF. I'm going to have a valuation of this even age stand, assuming all of that saw timber is saw timber at 100%, and I'm going to step it down and, and move that volume into pulpwood. So here's the first uh, valuation of uh, information I need to cut, and then what we have at the beginning of a new cycle after the cut. Here are the revenues based upon these mixed hardwood product prices, and again, the same 4% required rate of return. I have revenue for pulpwood, saw timber, and there was a, a provision of one cord top wood for each MBF, which is included here. Cutting cycle of 15 years, the valuation of that, but we have to subtract off the starting volume, which I get from this beginning of new cycle information for pulp wood, soft timber, top wood, and to come up with an approximate bare land value so I can compare the uneven age stand with the even age stand. So just to simplify that table there a little bit, 
There are the volumes at 100% saw timber allocation, as Putnam called for, dropping to 75%, increasing pulpwood, and the same at 50%. And those are the evaluations for this uneven aged system using mixed hardwood. And then comparing that now with the even aged systems. So you, you, you see where the relative valuations fall on these two systems. Um, at 100% saw timber valuation, you see you can calculate the, the difference there between mixed, ash, white oak, and then compare it with red oak. You can see why if timber production is the objective, there is going to be a trade-off if you want to manage for a more wildlife-focused regime. And, and that's the point of this, this analysis. And it also speaks to the importance of controlling for species. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, some of the limitations of this analysis, uh, Putnam did not provide us with information on log quality. Some colleagues of mine from Mississippi State will be speaking tomorrow about a new growth and yield simulator for hardwood they put together that does account for log quality. So that'll be interesting. Uh, again, the timber price data I'm looking at, it also does not account for, for log quality. And another limitation, a, a, a pure, even age stand of all red oak, again, that's not likely as well. So essentially, we'd have to try to average that a little bit. But obviously, the objective would be to have as much red oak as possible if timber production is the objective. All right. Now, I mentioned uh, the other research that my colleagues are doing on log quality as well. And I, I'd, I'd like to explore that more in terms of the valuation, because I think the gap between uneven aged and even aged would be higher, potentially. All right. Before I entertain questions, I want to take advantage of the fact that I have so many hardwood people in one room. Um, the IRS came out with a new audit technique guide at the end of the year. These are produced to assist revenue officers when they conduct audits. There's only 54 of them for the entire spectrum of businesses throughout the country. And they have a new one called Hardwood Timber Industry Audit Technique Guide. This is the document that the revenue officer consults before he audits you. Questions for landowners, sawmill owners, truckers and loggers. Word to the wise, look for increased timber audits. All right. One question. I'd say, go ahead. Go ahead. You've done a very thorough analysis of 52 year old data that was an estimate at that time. When here at this very station in November of 12, we looked at a 43 year old regenerated stand that did not have any saw log volume because the red oak mean DVA was 9.5 inches. So I don't see how you get near that yield that was estimated, a good estimate from 52 years ago. But why are we studying 52 year old estimates instead of <coughs> actual results? Uh, oh, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, what we saw out there was that uh, that standard had been damaged by the ice storm. We would have expected better growth rates than, than that. But uh, but not a whole lot better. That's not a very that, that particular site was not a very good site, but it was a heavy sharp and clay site. So if the stand we looked at that you're talking about uh, is probably not a good example of what's possible. Well, that's very understandable, and perhaps there's other stands that are in existence after 52 years yeah. could be studied to see actual results rather than Mr. Putnam's. Uh, best estimate from such a long time ago. Well, I'll, I'll just respond to that. This uh, this is a uh, um, uh, a research exercise, and there are there are still publications being produced off of Putnam's original recommendations. <laughs> Having said that, I'd love to, to have access to any hardwood production volume data you can provide me with, and I'll put the numbers to it. They, yeah, asking for collaborators. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take one more question. Go ahead, sir. Jenny, on the turn south, when I get that data, it doesn't break out of white oak, red oak, ash. How did you get those numbers? There, there's a supplemental report. Where it just shows values for the separate states. Yeah, yeah, and, and it shows it for uh, just about every product category. I mean, species category. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. What it doesn't show, it, does, it doesn't show fox elder or hackberry or the shade uh, tolerant species for saw timber markets. 
So that, that's another reason why I wanted to move some of that volume from Putnam's uneven age stand into pulpwood, because there's not going to be a, a, a saw chipper market for some of those. Thank you. All right. Question. Question. What does the opportunity cost per year for the lot of that stand? I need to have rotation age of about $1,200 spread over versus 300 or so. It would be comparable to something around $40 to $50. If you, with the assumption that you're you're producing already, it's lower as it, it, you get down to a, a stand and maybe have a uh, maybe would have a higher composition of white oak and ash relative to, to red oak. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, is Dr. Joseph Chen, and he is from the School of Renewable Natural Resources at Louisiana State University. Uh, I was asked to act for common just as you were the uh, historical records of uh, simple prices in Louisiana. Uh, between the city of South Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I was, I was asked to I could discuss the importance of bombing all the South Hebrew and public prices all the time on uh, how that actually may affect you know, our management. If you actually think about forest management in a much broader sense, um, there are more than just managing trees, really. Um, I kept telling the student, forest management is really asset management. In the sense that um, we're really trying to capture all the values from all different aspects. Um, May it be fish and wildlife, may it be outdoor recreation, may it be a range of grazing, or maybe environmental amenities, may it be soil and water conservation, or maybe timber. And you will notice that when you actually look at all the yellows, it actually says forest. Okay. Um, meaning that we will be doing our service ourselves a disservice if we just say we're only interested in only one aspect of it. Think about this way, if you were a broker and I came to you, your brokerage and say, um, I have half a million dollar assets um, in stocks and bonds, could you manage that for me? I will bet you the person who showed up with half a million dollar stocks and bonds probably also have some other assets, such as commercial uh, real estate properties or rental property, and in some situations that may even have timberlands. Um, then if you were a broker and you just say, oh, sir, you know, I can only handle your stocks and bonds, then that broker is really not capturing all the value of his coins. And by the same token, I think that's what we're looking at here. And I will, I will be willing to bet you that if I show up at Merle Lynch and say, I have half a million dollars in stocks and bonds in my portfolio. The broker will be falling all over themselves trying to get my, my business. I can tell you that much. Okay. Now, the goal, obviously, as we say, is to capture all the value and then maximize the value of the land, which is actually expressed here as the land expectation value. Now, most of you, um, if you were in forestry, have one version or a different version of the land expectation value formula here. And in this formula here, V is essential timber harvest income, and A here is your annual income from other sources, and C here is your regeneration cost, and R is your interest rate, and T is essential your rotation age. Now, this is an even age version, and for, for an even age, management, there is a version that's essentially the same as this version that um, does the land expectation and calculation. Now, more recently, there is also a generalized version of this. Now, one of the, the, the assumptions behind the land expectation and calculation when Fossman first did this in 1849 was the assumption that you can repeat this sequence again and again and again um, given a number of times. Now, we know better now that that's not true. Uh, you, could, you could either increase or decrease the value of the value from all of this over time uh, as known 
Mr. Davis pointed out this morning, when you actually did the even age manager on the, the bottom of the hand hardware, over time your value is actually going down because of the desirable species are disappearing. And that implies that the value in the future is actually going down. Now, now so what you want to be able to do is that you have a flexible management plan that was an opportunity to capture the for multiple product utilization. Uh, Southern Pine is a perfect example of that uh, because you have whole food <coughs> chicken salt and salt box. Now, I'll, I'll use a bad example of Taiwan because you know, that's where I grew up. Uh, in Taiwan, the Japanese came to Taiwan, they grew something called Cryptomeria japonica, or as we know it, say Suki pine. Well, one of the, the, the bad part of Suki pine is not good for anything else but for, you, for utility poles. And when I was a, when I was an undergraduate student coming down from the University of Experiment Forest, I noticed the utility company were, were dragging the, the cement pole up the pole, up the mountains, and then I realized that we're really in trouble because we're growing something nobody wants. Okay. Now, by the same token, having said that, you know, you also need to be market driven. Market driven means that you better grow trees that the market wants rather than want to grow trees because you can actually grow them. Okay, so here, as I say, you know, grow what you want to sell rather than what sell what grows. Okay, now the perfect example of that is what happened when I was in Kentucky. In eastern Kentucky, you, know, you have yellow poplar everywhere. They grow like weeds, okay? Well, the only problem is yellow poplar as well. Nobody really wants them, okay? They don't look very pretty, okay? They yellow greenish look, okay? With very few people, they don't actually like that, okay? Now, here's a perfect example that because if you were to grow yellow poppy, you're in deep trouble, that's all there is to it. Okay, you better think about some, some ways of actually growing one channel. Uh, how did you just say that some old stuff? Now, that's, that's what we call in marketing or economics called demand pull rather than production push. Now, production push means you're pushing with a rope. Okay, see how, how, how far you can push. Now, also, you need to have some historical perspective, understanding of the relative importance of different product classes over time. And that's where I was actually showing uh, about what happens. Here is essentially the story of the relative importance of Popo uh, over uh, Saltim. There we go. Now, you will notice that at the beginning, uh, Popo per core is selling for about 15% of the value of salt timber per thousand rupee. Now, the first year was 1965 that we actually compiled the data in Louisiana. And by the time of um, last year, we actually have something like 48 years of data. Uh, here, what you're showing for the end, the ratio is about 0.05, or 1, 1 over 20. Now, that was quite disturbing to me, uh, or actually very uh, encouraging to me in the sense that if you look at this and you say, well, I wonder what happens. Um, I, I happen to actually study pulp and paper industry a little bit, so I know a little bit of that. And I can tell you the reason is basically this. Now, for pulpwood, you have competition on a global basis. Uh, eucalyptus plantations are in, in established in Brazil and uh, all the other, several other countries, primarily now in Vietnam and say China. Now I was told by a friend of mine that they actually saw one eucalyptus tree that grow 15 feet and 7 inches in one year. Now if that wouldn't worry you, uh, nothing else will. Now, Having said that, um, one other thing I want to point out here is that um, because pulp wood typically in, in Brazil is actually, eucalyptus pulp is actually growing in about a seven year cycle. Now, that means they can actually produce pulp wood at a much lower price, and that actually drags down the pulp wood price of everybody else. Now, how low is that low? Now, here's the a, here's a table. Notice, um, on a global basis, the Brazilian cost is seventy-one dollar per per ton of chips, and Indonesia is one hundred and two. United States South is one hundred twenty-eight. Now, 
All the rest is not relevant as far as we're concerned. Globally, it's $132. So if Brazilian is only about, say, 70% of what we're doing, uh, local price is not going to go up over time. And that's all there is to it. Now, if you were thinking, oh, over time that will go up, maybe you should think differently. Now, power lumber is an entirely different story. The story here is basically this. Um, since I start in this business uh, as assistant professor, um, the U.S. power lumber industry uh, has become a, dom a global industry. Years ago, power lumber industry is primarily a domestic market industry. They don't actually care too much about the international market. Now we're actually the dominant player in, in terms of power lumber. Now, about 15% of the power lumber actually produced is now sold in the international market. Now, I also want to add, also mention that that 15% are typically on the higher end, so the FS and the number one commas and the selects. Um, to, when, I, when I say FS, does everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay, so first and second, and then that's the highest grade lumber. And typically, that's about 90% of our usable material in three, three inch by seven feet or four, four inch by four, five feet uh, cuts. Okay. Now, now, and the other thing that's interesting is that there are really no meaningful so-called plantation hardwood around. There are actually not many significant sizes. Uh, you hear about you know, black walnut plantations here and there, 300 acres here, 400 acres. They really don't, don't really uh, mean that much in terms of meaningful supplies. So that's important as well. And that means that um, for the foreseeable future, if you're thinking about oak, maple, cherry, and all the other major harvest species, chances are wrong. We're very busy. Uh, the only competition we have from Europe is for beach. Uh, there's a meaningful amount of beach coming out of Europe. Uh, West, Western European forest. Um, now, the interesting part of that is uh, if you look at that and you look at the declining ratio between pulpwood and salt timber, that means that if you are actually going to be managing for that over time, you probably want to think about a smaller Q ratio. Because if you have a high Q ratio, that means you'll be favoring a smaller diameter freeze. And if you're thinking about emphasizing salt timber, then your curl ratio will have to come down. At the same time, if you're thinking about even age plantations, your planting density will probably have to come down slightly. Uh, unless you worry about log quality, as uh, Dr. Anderson just mentioned. Now, there's, a, there's a fine line that you don't want to cross. And the other thing I want to say is that we understand much less about hardwood than we understand about pine trees in terms of the quality quantity ratios. And it will be very interesting to see what happens tomorrow when Tom Matthews started talking about his model. Now remember, model just a model just a model, okay? And I want to emphasize that, okay? Now, as, as a joke, okay? Uh, I have some friends who are like what we call econometricians who are in the business of economic forecasting. And he said, to err is human, okay? To get paid for doing that is divine. <laughs> okay. Now, and I regret that you know, even though I have a PhD in econometrics, I was uh, either smart enough or dumb enough not to get into that business, okay? And so, so. That's pretty Now, oh, okay. Now, as we mentioned just now, we're talking about capturing all the value from all different aspects. And A is actually a very important part of that. Now, uh, hunting lease is, is one important aspect of that. As far as I can tell, uh, hunting lease is probably one of the most brilliant events inventions of the southern forestry. Now, southern forestry has done all the wonderful things in the world. When I go around the world teaching about forestry, I kept telling people, you want to see industrial forestry come to the south, 
Okay, that's where the thing is really serious. Actually, I came down the south because of one of my industrial parts, to be perfectly honest. Now, no, so now all that is actually captured here in the A, I in the annual film series. Okay. Now, in the years past, when I first got started, um, I was told once upon a time, uh, people would be very happy if they get three, four dollars an acre so that they can pay the taxes, then the property taxes are somewhat inexpensive. Nowadays, uh, I noticed that um, there are some instances where you can get 30, 40, 20, 30 dollars per acre for that. Uh, and um, Dr. Jones, is that? The, the study just pointed that out, well, it's like 20 some dollars. Now, $20 an acre, well, put it at $24, because that's an easy number. $24 divided by 6% is $400 in present value that you can add it to the land value. Okay, and now we're talking serious money. And I have a friend, uh, I have a friend and a former student who was the manager of uh, a team. And I kept saying, I don't understand how can people pay that much money for an acre of bay land? You know, typically when you read those numbers, it's thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars. I said, are those people out of their minds or what? And she said, Well, not really. I said, beyond the timber value, what else do they include? Oh, they include the hunting lease money. Well, it is four hundred dollars, of course. You can see how that could add up quickly and say, Well, oh, some of them have hunt, um, mineral leases. So that adds another aspect to it. Okay, so you have money coming everywhere. You know, as I mentioned just now, you are really, we foresters and wildlife people, we really are asset managers. Okay, we will be doing ourselves a disservice if we only emphasize that aspect of it. Okay. Now, now when your income is in a 300, say four, five hundred dollar range, you are talking serious money. And to think about what it means when you actually manage your forest. If you only manage for timber, uh, how is that affecting your revenue from your uh, wildlife or hunting leases? Now, at the same time, you could also ask the same question. What would the increase in value that I'm going to be getting if I change my management regime? Is, uh, is a hunting lease going to change in value? If it's not, then obviously why? You need to be thinking twice about it. Okay. It's one thing to say, to say that, oh, we increase about the number of wildlife here and there, and it's another thing to actually say, we increase the hunting lease value. Because that's when it really matters. When people put the whole cash down, that's when it really matters. I can tell you, when I was out in the southern part of Mississippi trying to actually look for my timberlands, I got outbid every single time. And the people who outbid me are the, the doctors and lawyers and, and accountants, okay? And I kept thinking about timber production, they kept thinking about second homes, okay? Second home always outbid, outbid the timber production for sure, okay? And that's when people say, I am putting my money down, and that, that's when I shut up. Okay. Yeah. Now, therefore, you know, whether it's timber or wildlife, it's actually taking a legal role, obviously, it depends on who's talking. Now, then, then the, the question that comes in is where the tricky balance comes in. Um, I understand what here prefers yen stance, yes, no? And Turkey prefers old stance. Now, if you want to have young stance, then perhaps what? Your timber rotation has to be shorter. Now if you prefer turkey, then perhaps your timber rotation would have to be longer. Now, keeping in mind what I said at the bottom, uh, for, as economists, you know, we always emphasize the importance of interest rate. Now, a modest 6% interest rate um, at 45 years, the present value of that 1,000 bucks is only worth about uh, $67. So that's only about 1 15th of what you start with. So keeping that in mind, and therefore you would know what you should be actually going after, okay? 
Um, I have a student in Taiwan who is a manager of a recreational complex, i.e. hotels and all that. He said, Dr. Chan, which one should I put more emphasis on? I said, of course, on your recreational com com complex. He has hotels and motels on the yard. And he said, why? I said, well, understand, you get paid every day when you manage your hotels and motels. You only get paid once every so many decades. Now, tell me. Interest rate does speak and speak very loudly. Okay, with that, I'll close my presentation. Thank you. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Got a couple minutes, somebody has a question. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Kyle Cunningham. Almost Dr. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Kyle Cunningham. All right, where are my, where are my MSU summer camp grads? Come on, M MSU summer camp. Okay, okay. I'll just have to suffice it to say that one day in my life in summer camp, I was glad that Kyle Cunningham was with me. Okay, you know what I mean. All right, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, um, for anybody that, that doesn't didn't go to summer camp with me, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I uh, got my bachelor's and my master's at Mississippi State uh, under Dr. Ezel, and I'm currently um, working on a PhD up in Arkansas uh, through the biology department at UALR, and I'm an extension uh, instructor there uh, with the university also. But today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work I did on my master's uh, when I was up there at Mississippi State. And I'm going to kind of back up a little bit in the thought process. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you look at a, a hardwood stand, uh, oftentimes it's easy just to run in and start making decisions that here and here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. When you really ought to just back up and say, what is it that I want to do? We've seen a lot of this today. What is it that I want to do? And what is that initial decision that I, I need to make based on the current conditions of the stand that I'm going to manage or regenerate? Um, I'm really presenting some work that was performed by Tom Manuel back in the early 90s, and that's for the bottom line um, hardwood model. And the model that I worked on was the upland component of that, and that came along in 2000. <coughs> Both of the models, like I said, were developed at Mississippi State, and um, well, um, why manage for hardwoods? We've seen all the talks today talk about why manage for hardwoods, uh, all the multiple use benefits that we receive from hardwood stands, whether it be timber, wildlife, recreation, aesthetics, or water quality or air quality. Hardwoods can provide all of that for us simultaneously. And therefore, it's a great resource, uh, but it can also uh, create some complexity when we're going to make management decisions. Um, another thing about hardwood stands, they have a large number of species. Each of these species has specific site requirements, uh, and they can be very differing between the species. And the rotation ages are long, so any deci decision that we make is going to have implications for, for a long time. Um, and all of this leads to different levels of, of stem quality and, 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 and stem value. <coughs> and again, that, that initial decision that needs to be made uh, when we look at a stand is, should I go in the direction of management? And when I say management, it can be confusing. When I say management, um, I could be uh, talking about intermediate stand operations. I'm talking about we're going to manage the stand for an additional cutting cycle. And, and so that's where I'll use the term management or manage today. Another type of management is regeneration. Uh, but in the terms of the model, it's either going to be manage or regenerate. And if I'm going to regenerate, uh, then I'm going to, to go in the direction of artificial regeneration or natural regeneration. But this is just the thought process that you go through when you get into a hardwood stand. You're going to have an existing stand. You're going to have an objective for that stand. The model that I'm presenting today, uh, it has an overall assumption of saw timber production. Um, and then you're going to conduct a stand evaluation based on that, and again, go in the directions that I just talked about. Just to put it in perspective, I use this a lot of times when I'm with landowners, uh, just to um, 
give them an idea of what we're talking about here when we say manage or regenerate. Uh, this is just a, 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 a timeline of a rotation. If we had a stand that was 33 years old, we we're going to make our evaluation. A decision to manage would mean that we have enough desirable material present to carry that stand another 10 years. So, and then we would perform another evaluation at that point. A decision to regenerate is simply, I'm cutting the stand off here, we're going to be in year zero, and we're going to go in the direction of either artificial or natural regeneration. So those are the two decisions that you get from the model. It doesn't tell you uh, how you're going to regenerate, it doesn't tell you how you're going to manage, it doesn't tell you when to thin, those type of things. It just makes you think about where you are uh, and where that stand is uh, in management potential. And you'll hear me start talking about um, a gradient, so to speak, in management potential when it comes to soft temper. And stands can have a very low value, and that's easy to see oftentimes, and we'll get into why that is. And then stands can have a very high management potential, and those are easily easy to see as well. And there are, there are factors that drive that, and we're going to get into that. And then there's that middle ground, and that's where it really gets hard a lot of times um, when we're looking at stands, and, and I really call those borderline stands. And those become very difficult, even for a very experienced forester, uh, to make a decision. We'll talk about that more in depth. Um, you know, another consideration here: we're talking about uh, bottomland hardwoods, but you always want to look at um, your your position where you are, bottomland terrace upland, and then your desired product elements. And the model looks at uh, saw timber as a primary target uh, for for a management objective, and the reason for that we've seen in the previous slides. And here, this is just something I put together for, for Arkansas. If, if you look at the, the saw timber in the veneer versus the groundwood product production, uh, that's where the value is. You know, if you're managing for pulp wood, you're going to have much more volume than you are value, and you're also going to run into marketing issues as well, particularly in Arkansas. <coughs> so, the components of the stand evaluation what components are, are, that does the model use? It uses the management objective, and we'll get into the specific management objectives in a moment. Uh, those management objectives are based on site quality. We, we heard a little bit about that earlier. You, you can't apply one uh, scenario to every forest or every stand in the lower Mississippi alluvial valley. You know, there, there are differences in quality. So we have to have our management objectives based on that. Stocking of desirable species, that's a big one. There are really two things uh, that drive this model stocking of desirable species and the quality of those trees that are present. The health and vigor of the stems. How long can I carry this into the future without the risk of mortality or degrading? And then uh, the age of the stems. The model doesn't directly look at age, but anytime you're evaluating a hardwood stand, you really need to look at the age as well. Desirable species. We've seen this in all the previous talks so far, uh, and the model uses this as well, where we use red oaks, white oaks, Ash, the things that are going to give us the soft timber categories. Except, uh, acceptable species would be sweet gum, yellow poplar, hackberry, sugarberry, and then of course our unacceptable species would be red maple, elms, basically the, the trees that, that are more ephemeral and are not going to give us a soft timber product. So why oak species? And we've seen this in all the talks. And if you go to the literature and review the, the, the research literature that's out there, all of the objectives that we've talked about here today Oaks provide all of those. You know, they, they benefit each of those objectives and it's in the literature. You know, wildlife population can be cyclical with oak production, with acorn production. Um, timber, obviously, uh, we're looking at oaks and then with aesthetics and water quality. The important bottom loads for salt timber production, we're looking at cherry bark oak, not all oak. I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, but never heard to step back and say, what are we looking at? Again? And each of these has, has different growth characteristics. Different, different types of uh, management can implicate the quality, can, can uh, affect the quality of things. You know, with water and woodwork, you have to be careful how you manage those things. Uh, these, are the, these are the species that are gonna get us saw timber, uh, except for maybe overcup oak, but um, be special because he'll grow with nothing else. Quality of the stems, when we're talking about saw timber, we're talking about uh, grade one and grade two material. Those are gonna be the trees we wanna manage for. Anything in the, in the grade three and the, the pulpwood classes, uh, you know, not going to uh, contribute very well to this model. Tree vigor, pretty straightforward there. We want a full crown, no si signs of dieback or decay. 
and, the, and, a, and no signs of damage to the bulb. We want good tight bark with no corn branching in that. I wanted to talk about, uh, and I use this a lot with landowners as well, I wanted to talk about uh, stocking guidelines. And this was from Goals, and he, you know, he did this work uh, based on off of Putnam's, but this was what he came up with, and then I, I developed this table from some of his work. Um, but I like it because that's, this is essentially what the model does. Um, if you look at a stocking guideline, it doesn't take into account tree quality. Uh, James was talking about that earlier. What the model does is apply a, um, a tree quality factor in there. You know, if we just have a stand of trees and it has this stocking, then we could say it's fully stocked or we could say it's overstocked. But what pr proportion of that stand is in manageable trees? That's really what you're after when you're managing your timber. And uh, so, so adding to this a little bit is what the model does. Um, and again, desirable species and, and, and uh, quality. Uh, driver. So let me move into the uh, components, uh, specific components and how they work. And, and again, we're going to focus on the bottomland hardwood model. And again, I have to give credit to Tom Manuel because he was the one that originally uh, developed that. And it was based off of Putnam stocking guide. And then uh, basically he developed a point system where it would uh, come up with a value uh, that a single tree would contribute to, stand, to a, a stocking of the stand value. Essentially, the model, uh, you're going to put in a plot and the model's going to calculate a tree value. You're going to turn that into a plot value based on your plot size. And then you're going to get an overall uh, stand value. <coughs> it's based on three objectives for the bottom of the model. We'll get into those in a moment. And then there's a threshold value. And essentially, I haven't already stated what the model is doing is simulating the decisions of an expert hardwood forester. That's the goal of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the model. <coughs> and in the end, uh, the model takes the, the calculated stand value, compares it to a threshold value, and then simply makes a decision whether to manage or regenerate. The diameter of the tree provides a tree with its initial value. I'm not going to go too much into um, the uh, specifics of how the model was developed and how it works, but give you an overview of how it works. Um, the initial tree value uh, can range from 0.5 to 5.26. Uh, again, that's that point system from Putnam's uh, even age stocking uh, guide. And uh, essentially a six inch tree would give you, would start out with uh, 0 0.5 points. And then I think it's uh, what, about a 36 inch tree would give you 5.26 points. So range of values there. And then these other variables in here, you can see where we're starting to tweak things a little bit. Uh, we have species class. And a desirable species is going to get three points. An acceptable species is not really going to contribute. Well, neither will an unacceptable species. Unacceptable species are going to go into cutting stock. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Grades, this grade one is two points. I won't go through all of these. But you can see how uh, the individual tree characteristics that's the additive component of the model. And we'll see a formula in a moment that, that, that describes this a little, a little more. <clears throat> but essentially all of these kind of fine tune things. And a big component of the model is that it includes uh, tree class. And um, this was based on Putnam's uh, tree classification system of preferred, reserve, cutting, and cold, uh, cutting stock and cold trees, where our preferred trees are essentially the trees that are going to help us meet our management objectives. And for a saw timber standpoint, that means they're going to be desirable species. They're going to be number one and number two grade trees. They're not in any danger of mortality over time. And that's our preferred stock. Those trees will um, receive 100% of their value from the previous slide. Reserve stock trees, those are trees that could be of an acceptable species or maybe a desirable species that can't really uh, get us that number one grade down the road, but they're not in any danger of mortality over time. Cutting stock trees, those are simply um, undesirable species or a tree of a desirable species that's in danger of mortality in the next 10 years or degree. Cull trees are interesting. You know, the model looks at cull trees and those are going to be desirable species that will just never make great. They're never going to be um, merchandisable. And while the model looks at those and from a timber standpoint, you know, cull trees are not looked at very highly. 
but you know, we all know from a lot of life standpoint, those trees could, uh, you know, they could be hollow, they could have a lot of things going on for them uh, that could provide some wildlife value. But tree class is a, is a big component of the model and really provides some power to the model. Well, let's look at an example tree. If this particular tree, I just went with the max on everything just to show uh, an example here. But it was of a desirable species, so it got a grade three. It was three logs, so it was really tall. It got, got two points for that. It was a number one grade, uh, received two points for that. Had high vigor, received two points for that. And uh, it was co-dominant, so it received three points for that. We had a 20 inch, 20 inch of DBH, and from our from our uh, point contribution of that I showed you earlier based on tree size, that tree would start out with a value of 2.44. It would, this tree would, would easily go into the preferred tree class, and so it would receive 100% of its value. And you can see it's pretty straightforward, not, not higher math here. The tree value is, um, we get 100 from the tree class, and we have 2.44, uh, it's the initial uh, uh, points provided by diameter. And then you see the, the uh, individual tree characteristics, it's just an additive where you, um, the total is 12, and then you, you um, divide it by 12 and get a percent there. So there's really two adjustments to the tree value. There's the individual tree characteristics and the, and the, and the tree class. And of course, since this tree was perfect, you got a 2.4. That would be going up to your plot level and then the stand level, which is on a per acre basis. Our objectives, these are uh, timber-based objectives for bottomland bark woods. And uh, Tom Manuel and, and Dr. Hodges and Keith Bell are the ones that initially put this together um, and again these are just some, some different alternatives um, for uh, timber management it has to do really with the ability to merchandise some of this material um, and whether or not uh, you would want to uh, carry a stand well into the future and, and that's through a maximum allowable diameter and whether sweet gum it should say under 12 inches you, whether sweet gum under 12 inches is acceptable or unacceptable. And um, there's, there's three of those where we kind of toggle back and forth between the, the, uh, the acceptability of those, those variables. All right, this is the input. Um, and one thing I didn't state is uh, both of those programs um, put a lot of late nights in, putting those into a Windows <laughs> environment because Tom's was in a DOS somewhere. But uh, this, this is the, uh, if you crank the program up and you go to the input data this is the spreadsheet that you get and both of these programs are on the forest resource website at Mississippi State under the um, uh, 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 software I think it is and you, you, I can get you that information or Dr. Ezo can if you need it but um, essentially you're going to choose your objectives up top you're going to put in your plot size your number of plots you can really put in about 40 plots at a time in here you're going to have a stand name and and uh, you can see the variables that I went through earlier that, that the model uses. And we're going to skip ahead here and look at some real data. Um, the species code is something I'd point out is, is kind of important. I set this up in, in uh, three letter code, but the only one that really matters is sweet gum. If you ever use this, always use SWG for sweet gum uh, because when you toggle between the objectives, it'll recognize the SWG and automatically make the corrections on tree class. The other species, you can make up whatever you want for them. But, um, and you're going to input your species class as desirable, acceptable, unacceptable. You only have to input the grade, vigor, and crown class and height on your salt timber tree. Um, obviously, you don't need that on the um, whole size material. Okay, after we input all that data and we run, um, this is the output, this is our, our output view. And again, you can see, I only did one plot here um, on my, my sample stand, um, but you can see where there's, a, there's room for 40 plots per input run. Uh, the decision on that stand was to regenerate. It had a value of um, 20.6, and the cutoff index for objective two was 35. Um, the, the, this, the other thing that, comes, that I want to point out here is this was um, something we added to the model uh, from the original, and that's a saw timber analysis. So all those trees where you're entering 
the uh, vigor and the, and the grade and the height and those types of things. Um, it gives you a breakdown of your tree class, your preferred, your reserved, your cut, cutting stock and pole, and then species class composition, and that's a big one. Um, and, and it really gives you a numerical picture of, of the stand and, and, and uh, can help you understand what's going on in the stand and get a picture of what's, what a good stand looks like and what a bad stand looks like. And again, there's the other individual tree class variables, height class, crown, bigger. This breaks it down by percent. Okay, this is kind of what I wanted to get to. Um, I talked earlier about the range of management potential for saw timber production of hardwood stands. And that, that could be from very low to very high. A very low stand is obviously going to be regenerated, like the first stand I just walked through in the example. Our threshold value for um, objective one was 50. The stand value is 20.6, and we have a you know, objective applied as a diameter limit of uh, 26 inches, which can play a big factor if you have large trees, because large trees are going to have um, a higher point uh, value to start with. You know, if you had a 28 inch tree, you know, that's going to start with like a almost probably 3.8 or a 4 somewhere in there. Um, so anyway, the diameter, diameter can play a big role. Um, you know, the, the, the sweet gum, the toggling of the sweet gum, you know, depending on, you have to have a good bit of present for it to really affect things that much. Some stands do. Some stands don't have any sweet gum, so it may or may not be a factor. Um, so our decision here was, was to regenerate on that stand. And like I was saying, you see this range here. And we'll get down into, into the uh, second table in a moment. Our, what I call our borderline stand, that stand uh, scored 52.7, so it was right there at the threshold value. If it was 49.9, that's regenerated. If 52.7, it's managed. Does that mean the model's right? Who knows? <laughs> at that fine of a, of a level, we, you know, that's a stand that could really go either way, and that's what I wanted to point out here. This, there, you got to remember what drives this. There, there's two things that drive that regenerate stand. The stocking of desirable species, because let's go down here, all of these stands are either fully stocked or overstocked. And this is real data, we went out and took the data into it. Um, all of these stands are either fully stocked or overstocked. Uh, our regenerate stand had a DBA, average deviation of about 13 inches and 105 trees per acre. So we're just looking at goals as stocking guidelines, we're stocked. But if we look at our preferred and reserved portion of the basal area, it's only 33 square feet out of 107. And so that's where uh, some of these factors I'm talking about come in and, and, and drive the desirability of the uh, management potential to stand for soft timber production. And that's species composition, whether it's desirable species, acceptable species, or unacceptable. And then the quality of those. You, know, you can have a, a water willow oak stand that was opened up too much and your species composition is fine, but the log range is not going to be there. So it's a component of both of those things. And just the opposite of that is going to be true in our managed stand. Our managed stand, in this case, it was actually a pretty small average diameter. Uh, we had a lot of trees per acre, and it was one of those, it was actually a water oak. <laughs> it was a water oak, but there was a lot of those trees present per acre. Uh, they're small diameter, uh, they were in good condition. So you really can't say uh, anything other than that stand has a good potential to it. Um, and those are easy. You know, the species composition is good and the grade's good. So both of those are fine. What happens is on these borderline stands, you're going to have some component of both of those. You're going to have some desirable species, you're going to have some undesirable or unacceptable species, and you're going to have you know, some higher quality and some lower quality. And when you start looking at those stands, um, it, it, can, it can become really complicated in whether or not um, or what you should do with that stand. So the, uh, let me make sure I'm not skipping anything I want to point out here. Okay. All right, let me just sum it up with this. Like I said, the stocking of desirable species and tree quality drive the stand value. And you know, for saw timber, we're looking at oaks and, and ash and those type of species. If you get into managing for, and, and resulting in other species and those, then your stands are going to get those lower values. 
Um, BVH can play a significant role. If you manage your stands for a long period of time and you wind up with those 28, 30 inch trees, uh, those can really impact uh, the stand value based on your objective. And just want to say the, uh, the uses of this model, really its primary use, is probably its highest use would be for training um, uh, inexperienced hardwood managers and getting an idea for what good and bad is in a stand. And also for ranking. Uh, you could rank the needs of your different stands based on these stand values. You know, a stand that scores very low, it may need some, initial, some, some immediate attention where a stand that has a high amount of potential, you might be able to leave it alone for a while. And then in those borderline stands, you're standardizing the decision-making process. You know, this model, it's not going to give you the right answer for your situation every time, but you're standardizing things. You're not just shooting, throwing darts, so to speak. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to be glad to take any questions. Yes, yes. That was uh, objective three. Uh, basically, objective one and two, you had a 26 inch maximum allowable diameter. It just toggled sweet melon is acceptable or unacceptable. Objective three, you can grow trees as large as you want for as long as you want. Um, and then sweet melon is also acceptable from that point. All right, very good. Let's take a 20 minute break, reconvene at three o'clock. Mm -hmm.